Uh, welcome everyone uh, to the NCCN Academy for Excellence uh, in Leadership in Oncology. Uh, I'm Robert Carlson and had the privilege of being the CEO uh, of NCCN. Uh, we think we've put together a very uh, timely and interesting uh, group of topics to talk about uh, today. Uh, as you can see from the agenda, it's really divided into two separate parts. Uh, first will be a didactic presentation, um, and that will be followed uh, by a panel uh, discussion uh, moderated by Dr. Goodman. Uh, in terms of the didactic discussion, uh, it is being pr presented to us by Dr. Mark uh, Stewart. Um, Dr. Stewart has been professor of medicine at the University of Washington since 2000, uh, and is the medical director of the Seattle Cancer Care Alliance member of the Fred Hutchinson Cancer Research Center and is attending physician at Harvard View Medical Center and the VA Puget Sound Medical Center. Uh, Dr. Stewart is a member of the NCCN Board of Directors. Uh, he co-chairs the NCCN Best Practices Committee. Uh, he's a member of the Guidelines Steering Committee and is a past member of the NCCN Executive Committee. Uh, unfortunately for Seattle, uh, fortunate for City of Hope, Dr. Stewart recently announced that he will be leaving the city leaving uh, Seattle and moving to the City of Hope National Medical Center in Duarte, California, fortunately, uh, another NCCN uh, member institution. Uh, the COVID-19 uh, pandemic has certainly impacted uh, the world's uh, uh, healthcare uh, systems, uh, and that is especially true of oncology care uh, in the United States. And uh, Dr. Stewart, uh, being in Seattle, has been uh, central uh, and at the forefront of the uh, oncology community responding to the COVID-19 uh, uh, pandemic, as has the Best Practices Committee, uh, which he co-chairs. So we've uh, asked Dr. Stewart to provide an update on the impact of COVID-19 uh, on patients with cancer. And with that, I'll turn it over to Dr. Stewart. Okay, well, thank you, Bob. Um, what I'd like to do today is to give a, a brief overview of uh, COVID-19 uh, and its impact uh, in first in general uh, on the population at large and then focusing more uh, specifically on cancer patients. So to begin with a couple of definitions, um, COVID-19 usually refers to the coronavirus uh, disease and we use the term SARS-CoV-2 to refer to the virus itself. This is a, a uh, graphic depiction of an RNA virus uh, that, that would resemble uh, the SARS-CoV. You can see the RNA here, which uh, encodes for the genetic information that's required for the virus to replicate, a spike protein that's important for attaching the virus to uh, cells that they infect, and the lipid membrane that really holds the complex together. So there have been uh, three major coronavirus pandemics or uh, worldwide spreads of uh, virus in the past. You can see here in 2002, uh, the first SARS-CoV uh, infection occurred with about 8,000 cases uh, and a relatively high mortality. The second one was largely focused in the Middle East in 2012 smaller number of cases, but a greater mortality. And finally, dramatically contrasting with the previous two, you can see that to date, as of this morning, there were 10 million cases diagnosed worldwide with 502,000 deaths attributed to this. Now the estimated mortality here is fluctuating because there are probably many more cases that haven't been diagnosed and that would, of course, lower this effective mortality rate. We'll talk about that in a moment. So this is a, a depiction of how the virus here with its protein spikes interacts with a cell that it may infect. And the virus interacts with an angi angiotensin converting enzyme 2 receptor that is a uh, uh, dependent upon activation of the protein spike by another protein here on the cell surface. So the virus attaches and then is internalized into the cell where it begins to make new viruses. But this protein spike is very important and maybe one of the um, anatomic pieces that may be uh, targeted for different therapeutic interventions. Now a brief word about how uh, SARS-CoV-2 is spread. 
There are a couple of ways that we think about transmission. One is the droplet mode and the other is the airborne mode. The droplet mode uh, is basically where one has very large droplets that contain viral particles. And these tend to fall quickly at a rate of about one uh, foot a second and therefore do not spread uh, horizontally at a great distance. On the other hand, tiny particles can spread for uh, many feet and different diseases exhibit different patterns of spread. So for example, Ebola is largely a droplet transmission. SARS-CoV-2 is largely, but not exclusively, a droplet transmission. Whereas diseases like measles, uh, chicken pox, and TB are much smaller particles and are at greater risk uh, of spreading. Uh, by an airborne transmission mechanism. So other clinical considerations, uh, transmission is uh, largely, as I mentioned, by droplet, although the virus uh, is found in the feces. There's no evidence that a fecal oral transmission has been a significant way of spreading the virus to date. And you may have heard that the virus actually persists on surfaces for hours to days. Again, no one has shown that this is a major risk for transmission. Thus, the major efforts for resources have been to really focus on the droplet transmission. The incubation period is about two to 14 days with an average of five to six. And as most of you know, fever is the presenting feature, the most common feature with cough and fatigue being other uh, symptoms. Just recently, the CDC added three new symptoms, diarrhea, nausea, and nasal congestion. Now, in an effort to try to screen people, uh, screening, of course, consumes lots of resources, so there are a lot of technical innovations that have been uh, developed, uh, including these uh, various robots that have been used for screening. And they're using, of course, uh, remote thermometers, that is, using heat mapping sensation to determine temperatures. They can actually do this in groups of people. And so it's a very efficient way, if one employs this, to try to screen patients, at least from a temperature point of view. These machines can also ask questions, hand out masks, et cetera, depending on the complexity uh, of the machine. They can actually detect to see if you're actually wearing a mask. So a lot of technical advances here that may, uh, if one purchases these machines, may limit the resources in terms of in-person screening uh, that we need to accomplish. So other less common symptoms and conditions that are associated with SARS-CoV or COVID-19 include what's called COVID toes, which a picture here uh, is shown where the uh, toes become reddened and painful, may relate to a vasculitis, anosmia where you lose your sensation of smell, pink eye or a follicular conjunctivitis here. Uh, and this is important because uh, this is one route of being able to acquire uh, COVID-19, uh, and hence the reason for having these full plastic uh, facial masks that extend up above your eyes as protection. We talked about diarrhea, chest pain, thrombosis, renal failure, and Guillain-Barre disease. So if one looks at the different risk factors for uh, who is at risk for mortality, for COVID-19. Uh, this is recently published from um, the European uh, data and basically shows that about 20% of the population in Europe uh, is over the age of 65. And that represents about 90% of the deaths uh, as at least through May of this year. So this age group of 65 and older, as most of us know, uh, is the group that is most susceptible to the risk of dying from a COVID uh, infection. Other factors, risk factors that play into this, of course, are uh, cardiovascular disease, diabetes, and chronic lung disease as comorbidities. And in this case, uh, hospitalizations were six times higher and deaths 12 times higher for patients with some of these underlying conditions. So one can begin to develop a profile for who is at most risk. Uh, children, of course, adolescents and young adults have the lowest risk for death. Middle-aged persons who have a few comorbidities uh, begin to increase that risk. 
And of course, again, it's that elderly group uh, in the above age 65 that presents with the greatest risk for dying uh, with COVID-19. Now, what about patients who don't have symptoms or are pre-symptomatic but infected with uh, COVID? As I mentioned, the median incubation period from exposure to symptom onset is about four to five days. And once people are exposed, about 97% uh, will have symptoms within 11 days. Now, the hard part is that you may be infectious one to six days before you actually have symptoms. And this, of course, accounts for the very uh, difficult problem of, of having patients or uh, infected persons spread the virus uh, without really being able to screen for that. So uh, the most infectious time period, that is when the viral load is the greatest, occurs shortly before and soon after symptom onset, and then falls over about one week. Because of these asymptomatic carriers, it's estimated currently, and this may change, that for every one person who's identified as infected, 10 additional people are infected without being diagnosed. And so Johns Hopkins has revised their estimates for the infection fatality risk now to be about 0.5 to 1%, which is significantly lower um, than previously predicted, but still very, uh, very much more than influenza in terms of death rate. So there are a number of controversies uh, that still are uh, in play. Do we know the true incidence and mortality of COVID-19? And what is the role of serology? That is the, the ability to measure antibody formation after exposure. How does that play into determining whether you're truly immune uh, from subsequent COVID infections? And then of course, how accurate are the different tests that are used to detect uh, antibody formation and its specificity? Second, which patients should uh, delay cancer treatment in the COVID era? And I suspect that'll be a topic of the panel discussion. And then perhaps most controversial is how does the COVID pandemic fit into the context of what we sacrifice? So we tolerate deaths from other diseases, uh, accidents, uh, heart disease, flu, pneumonia, yet at least in the current day, we don't tolerate very well COVID deaths. Um, we've taken radical measures to uh, constrain this virus. And uh, it has, of course, cost a fair amount in terms of economic hardship uh, for millions of people. Uh, this raises the question of, are there other models worthy of consideration, such as those in Sweden? So uh, the, the Swedes, of course, have been more liberal uh, in terms of uh, their criteria for partially locking down. And, but they've also uh, assumed a higher death rate of about 8%. And this is significantly different from their neighbors in other Scandinavian countries with much lower rates and a tighter lockdown. But as you can see here, as of uh, yesterday, the number of new cases in Sweden is actually increasing, but the death rates are actually decreasing here, which might suggest that Sweden is beginning to focus uh, more on protecting its older age group, and perhaps there's more liberalization uh, of some of the protective measures among the younger population. I should mention that uh, in Sweden, there are a number of articles that talk about how the Swedes kind of naturally distance themselves and the new criteria that we adopt for distancing might actually bring them closer together. So what do we know about cancer patients and COVID? Um, a couple of things. Uh, we're not sure if cancer patients on active treatment or with a history of cancer are more likely to contract COVID. We know that patients with active cancer that are infected have a greater likelihood of serious complications and death and more rapid infectious uh, progression. This is particularly true in, the, in patients with hemologic malignancy and lung cancer. And for the survivors, the cancer survivors, it's not exactly clear whether they will have more serious complications from a COVID infection, but some of the preliminary data are 
somewhat worrisome. And finally, post-surgical mortality may, in some cases, be as high as 25% in COVID-infected patients. Well, if, with all of that uh, being thought about over the last several months, uh, Dr. Deborah Schrag from the Dana-Farber has looked at uh, a prioritization scheme, uh, which is fairly simple. Uh, number four here being uh, those patients who need treatment the most, who have the highest priority. And those are people, for example, with testicular cancer or, or the treatment of acute leukemia, where clearly the treatment is important in order to cure their disease or dramatically improve their survival. And there's category three, where delay of care would have a moderate effect on quality or quantity of life. For example, forms of adjuvant therapy where it may improve survival by uh, a 5% margin, for example. And then there's care that really can't be delivered remotely, but omitting it or delaying it uh, can have little effect on quality of life, such as bone agents for metastatic disease or treatment of metastatic disease with marginal uh, agents. And then finally, there's care that's not time sensitive and can be delivered remotely, survivorship or, or surveillance care in the absence of symptoms. And someone might even put in some of the preventative measures um, that could be delayed a month or two. Now, does COVID increase the risk of death with cancer treatment? And this was an interesting study that was just published in The Lancet. Um, and it's a UK study looking at 800 patients and you can see all these patients had COVID uh, of varying severities, and some received chemotherapy and some didn't receive chemotherapy. So 35% received chemotherapy, two thirds did not. And you can see in aggregate, the death rate was 28%, which is pretty high for uh, all patients with 72% of patients uh, surviving. Now, if you broke this down into uh, those who receive chemotherapy versus no chemotherapy, hormone therapy versus none, immunotherapy versus none, or radiotherapy versus none, there was really no difference in the outcomes here. Uh, one could say that perhaps there's a selection bias here, but this is a fairly large number of patients. And so it'll be interesting to see what other studies come out and say about the risks of uh, treating patients who've had COVID uh, uh, actively within the past, in this case, for weeks. Now the other aspect is, in, is looking at delays in treatment. And so one of the hypothetical or modeling studies that was done by uh, and led by the director of the National Cancer Institute, published in Science uh, just a few days ago, was an attempt to try to say, Many of the patients have been reluctant to come in for their screening measures or for their treatments. And we know that delaying diagnosis or delaying treatment may impact survival. And so with these considerations, there was an extensive mathematical model here to look at colorectal cancer and breast cancer and to predict a cumulative excess number of deaths over these years from this short six month perhaps period where one would delay uh, a diagnosis or treatment. And ultimately it works out to a substantial number of deaths that may occur uh, based on these delays. Now telehealth is another uh, part of uh, what has been a transformative type of practice uh, in the United States and elsewhere. This is an NCCN best practices survey that looked at uh, the role of telehealth. So we look here at first in-person visits before COVID-19, and we find that the vast majority of centers, our centers, 21 centers surveyed here, uh, of course, do in-person visits uh, only. However, currently, that has changed pretty dramatically with 55% of centers conducting 70 to 80% of outpatient visits in person and the remaining virtual or telehealth visits. The second question that we asked in the survey, well, what is the likelihood your cancer center will continue to offer telehealth by video visits following uh, COVID or ongoing? And here you can see new patient visits 
uh, where the centers are somewhat likely to continue that uh, following resolution of COVID, uh, but more likely to continue this in patients who are on observation or maintenance therapy, and perhaps slightly less likely for those who are on follow-up visits related to active therapy. So I think telehealth is probably here to stay in the groups of patients that we treat. Now, there's a major uh, financial impact to COVID, uh, and this is one hospital that will go unnamed, uh, where we see the uh, dramatic drop-off when uh, in March of surgical cases. And this had a pr profound effect uh, not only on delaying care uh, of different types, uh, but also on the financial impact of this particular hospital. Here you can see the revenue that is projected to be lost over a five month period, $182 million. And that's uh, positioned against the efforts to try to recover some of that from the government and other sources uh, with to date about a $58.6 million recovery. So the results here, I think, show substantial impact financially on uh, this hospital. And this hospital, I should say, is a general academic hospital. So treatment updates for COVID-19, we have uh, remdesivir, um, which uh, showed uh, very good um, results in vitro, but the effects have been relatively modest in, in single digits, uh, 11 days versus 15 days for a better recovery time, a slight decrease in death rates, um, an improved oxygenation rate when this drug is given. And just today in the, new, in the Wall Street Journal, uh, the price here has been uh, determined for, uh, this, uh, for a series of treatments that would address uh, uh, the COVID-19 infection. We've heard recently about dexamethasone, uh, largely focused on people who are critically ill with hypoxia and mechanical ventilation with uh, lower death rates, uh, largely attributed to the inflammatory reaction that occurs and the effect of dexamethasone on that. And then, of course, in China, there's been uh, the case reports of dramatic improvement when uh, patients' sera or plasma has been infused uh, in uh, plasma from people who are recovering from COVID has been inf infused into those with active and severe infections with dramatic improvement. There have been another, a number of vaccines, and this is a selected list. There are probably 10, 10 more companies that are developing vaccines. You can see here a couple of mechanisms. One is the traditional inactivation of the virus and then injecting it. Uh, two companies here using that method. And then a newer method is to use messenger RNA uh, and using self-amplifying RNA as a mechanism. And this is shown here where you can actually insert the RNA uh, gene or insert the protein spike uh, gene into the RNA, wrap it in a lipid uh, particle. It goes into the cell and begins to produce COVID protein spikes in the patient. And it's this uh, generation that leads to a, a strong immunogenetic response in the patient without actually giving the patient a virus. Similarly, one can introduce a gene that actually causes the RNA not only to uh, introduce this protein, but also to have the RNA replicate so that it actually gets more copies on the surface. Cases arising here again in the United States, as you can see here. Uh, and this probably is largely related to the fact that we're relaxing our distancing measures here, as shown in uh, this very active and dense densely populated beach, and that most of this occurs in younger people. So the younger people are getting out uh, and having higher infection rates. So to summarize in uh, our post-pandemic planning process, I think no one really has a good idea of what's on the other side uh, of this. It's likely, of course, that SARS-CoV-2 will not just disappear. Uh, we're seeing this with the surges. And so as we go forward, we'll need to weigh the risks of infection that uh, could potentially spread to patients and staff, uh, how we uh, look at risk as we determine the different treatment options, what resource constraints we'll continue to employ, and 
of course, our public health concerns. So I think as we look at our own uh, centers, I think we've made substantial progress in protecting our patients and our employees. The rates here are quite low, lower than we ever expected based on the rigorous uh, processes that we've put in place. And of course, many of the lockdowns have provided our communities with protection too. This has, however, been a very costly ordeal. Happy to answer questions. Dr. Stewart, thank you so much uh, for that uh, really informative uh, presentation. You know, think, thinking of all the information that you provided, it's hard to believe that it's only been less than four months uh, since uh, it became generally realized in the United States that uh, COVID-19 was going to be a healthcare problem for us. So incredible amount of process and progress in a very short period of time, but obviously, uh, obviously we need more. Um, unfortunately, I think because of the interest of time and, and our agenda, we'll need, we'll need to move on, but thank you so much, Dr. Stewart.